Thanks all for joining us for the Strong Women, Strange Worlds Friday uh, Quick Reads session. This reading is brought to you by the fabulous group of people that you see on your screen there right now. We are a group of authors, supporting authors. Our mission is to elevate the voices of women and other underrepresented gender identities, authors in science fiction, fantasy, and horror through events like these, our bi-monthly virtual quick read sessions. You can find out more about Strong Women, Strange Worlds in the handout that we're going to provide to you in the chat and by visiting their website and also the, uh, the website link will pop into the chat uh, once I or one of the other administrators has a moment to do so. So I'm going to be your host today. My name is Elaine E.C. Ambrose, and you'll find out a little bit more about me in the provided handout, which will include little bios and links for all of the people who are reading with us today. So today we're featuring five authors, Kay Hardy Campbell, Penelope Flynn, Carrie Lynn Jones, Wendy Van Camp, and Tori Bovolino. Each author will have eight minutes to read. So it's gonna be fun, it's gonna be fast, and hopefully you'll get a lot of different kinds of things today. A couple of quick notes. We're gonna be pasting a link for a Google survey in the chat. Uh, that link will pop up several times during the, uh, during the uh, session, and also it'll show up again at the end. If you fill it out, you can not only let us know what you thought of the reading and give us ideas uh, for things that we should work on, you can also be added to our mailing list, which is the best way to find out about future events, including our fabulous party upcoming in December, and also to win free books or receive swag from our authors, about which you will hear more when each person speaks. That means that it must be time to begin. Are you ready? Let's go. Our first reader today will be Kay Hardy Campbell a lifelong student of the Arabic language, culture, history, and music. Kay majored in Arabic at the university and lived in Saudi Arabia for several years. She writes about Arab culture for Aramco World magazine and is a director of the Arabic Music Retreat. On her first visit to Morocco, she felt instantly drawn to the Medina of Fez, sensing that history was very near. Kay, take it away. Thank you, Elaine. Good morning, everyone. I'm so delighted to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I'm sure you, you know about some of the major cities of Morocco, like Casablanca and Marrakesh. There's also Rabat, the political capital, but most importantly to my heart is Fez, which is considered the spiritual capital of Morocco. The premise of my book, The Sons of Fez, A Time Travel Adventure in Morocco, is that there's a summer Arabic program, of which, by the way, there are many that set up in Morocco. And this particular Arabic program draws students from all over the world and they travel around Morocco while they study Arabic. Fez is unique in that its old city, like many Arab cities, it has an old city, which is called the Medina. This Medina is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and inside the walls of the Medina, there are no ve motorized vehicles allowed. And in, in this uh, story, the, the students arrive in Fez as the last stop on their journey, and they are staying there for three weeks. And they're staying in what's called a Riyadh, which is a an old mansion. And in this case, it's been repurposed into a, a hotel or a guest house for all the students to say. So this takes place on their first night in Fez, what I'm going to read for you. And they're outside the Riyadh, alongside, there's an, a little alleyway where there's a strange beggar woman that sits all day underneath a stone arch. The setting is on the flat walled roof of the Riyadh, which is common for these buildings to have these uh, flat walled roofs where you can go and enjoy the cool night air. So let me begin. After supper, the group gathered on the rooftop. While they drank mint tea and ate orange slices sprinkled with cinnamon, Ibrahim, the tour director, and Dr. Charles, the Arabic program director, introduced everyone to Khalid, the manager of the Riyadh. Khalid told them a bit about the neighborhood and passed out simple maps of the Medina in case they get lost. After he was done, Dr. Charles took a deep breath and said, One last announcement. As you know, when you signed up for this trip, you agreed to surrender all your electronic devices during our stay in Fez. A collective groan rose from the crowd. Like everyone else, Barbara had forgotten about the clause in the program agreement they'd all signed. We will store your devices in the hotel safe. 
The day after your last exam, you'll get them back. Dr. Charles continued, Remember, Fez is a unique and historic place. We believe that while you're here, nothing should come between you and your surroundings. In the Medina, you can actually converse in classical Arabic with any shopkeeper. And in class, we don't want you recording. Learn directly from your ears and your handwriting the way humans have learned languages for thousands of years. This way, you'll be better prepared for the final exam, which is in three weeks. Dr. Charles waited for verbal protests, but got only groans, sighs, and shaking heads. Remember, this is the only intact medieval Arab city in the world. We want you to experience your days here directly, without digital interference. Professor Maureen and I will be collecting all the devices you listed when we arrived in country. Though all the students had known this was coming, it seemed to Barbara, who was an undergrad studying Arabic, that they, she was upset about turning in her phone and tablet. But she realized that she'd stopped taking pictures and checking messages in social media since their second day on a desert recent desert trip. She realized that it wasn't so bad to be disconnected from the outside world. Once all the devices were turned in and registered, Khalid and his staff carried the bags full of them down to the hotel safe. As soon as they disappeared down the staircase, two loud drum beats rang out from another rooftop entrance. A line of ten drummers paraded out onto the patio. Dressed in white jalabas with red tasseled tarbushes on their heads, they held frame drums in front of them at shoulder height as they pounded out a catchy, complicated rhythm. Barbara jumped up and swayed in place, dropping her shoulders to catch the rhythm of the syncopated beats. Others joined her in dancing and clapped with enthusiasm. The drummers smiled and laughed, enjoying the effect their surprise interest had on the students. The drummers ended the jam with a flourish and the students set up a cheer. Then the Riyadh staff brought out another round of tea and a new calm seemed to settle over the group. For Barbara, the night and the sky and the music banished thoughts of texts and posts, though she was sure a few fingers twitched at not being able to take a selfie or post a video clip. Barbara wandered back to a previous lookout she had earlier in the day and peered into the alley below. Even in the dark, she could see that old woman was still sitting there, her arm outstretched. The beggar looked up at Barbara, and her eyes reflected green light like a cat's eyes. Barbara backed away in shock. It was as if she'd seen a djinn. It was, if it was anything, she thought. It must be a djinn, those spirits that share the world with humans. They were said to be thick and close in Morocco. They'd been hearing about the djinn throughout their trip. They were advised to be careful when open closet, opening closets and stepping into houses and even into rooms. At such time, they were told to utter God's name for protection. Barbara called Maureen over and they peered into the alley. Again, the green eyes glowed in their direction. Maureen let out a scream and the tour guide Ibrahim dashed over. Look down in the alley, that old woman, she's got green eyes and they glow. For just a moment, a look of fear appeared on Ibrahim. Ibrahim's face, and he muttered, in the name of God. Barbara could see that he was willing himself to calm down. By then, the group knew that he was incredibly superstitious. He had told them lots of Moroccan lore about the supernatural. He pulled his shoulders back, stepped to the edge of the wall, and leaned over. He jerked his head back, then looked at the two women in alarm, and without saying a word, he ran down the stairs. A minute later, the women watched as Ibrahim and Khalid appeared in the alley and approached the old woman. Ibrahim shouted at her, while Khalid gripped Ibrahim's shoulders and pushed him back. The woman stood up in the middle of the alley and started talking back, waving her arms dramatically. They were speaking in lightning-fast dialect. No one could make out any words. After a few exchanges, she seemed to calm them down, and it looked as if they'd come to an understanding. They gave her some coins and left her alone. Wow! I wonder what her story is, Barbara said. I've never seen Ibrahim so freaked out. Laying in bed that night, Barbara was grateful that her room opened only onto an interior courtyard, not onto the alley. Yet she pitied the old woman and wondered if she still sat there all alone and if she had a home at all. Thank you for letting me share a little bit about the story, um, The Sons of Fez, Moroccan Time Travel Adventure. You can get it on any um, e-tailing 
site of, of you know the standard sites i also this is my second book my first one is set in saudi arabia a caravan of brides it's women's fiction um, this is such a great opportunity i thank you terry elaine and ann for um, everything you've done to bring us all together today and i have two giveaways today an ebook copy and a paperback and um, i look forward to um, watching everyone else and thanks again hope you enjoyed the story Thank you so much, Kay. That was a beautiful way to begin by taking us on a trip to a, a distant land. Maybe later on after the readings are over and we get to the Q&A part, um, I would be very curious to hear you say a few things in Arabic. In the meantime, I'd like to introduce our next reader. Oh, and uh, by the way, for those of you who are just joining us, there is going to be a survey that you can fill out so you can sign up for those mailing lists and receive the, um, the giveaway freebie items or be entered to win that paperback copy. So our next reader is Penelope Flynn. Hi. Penelope writes and illustrates adult targeted horror, suspense, science fiction, and fantasy. Her works have been in several anthologies, and the third book of her Chronicles of Renfields series launches in September 2021. Penelope, over to you. Thank you. Um, in Bram Stoker's Dracula, there's a character named R.M.S. Renfield. As an inmate in an asylum, he was determined to be zoophagous, manic, a henchman to the Count Dracula, and of course, a madman. But what if he wasn't mad at all? Maybe this was his job. The Chronicles of Renfield's posits, what if RMS wasn't alone, but was a member of Renfield's, an ancient international clan of vampire human hybrids who functioned to take care of and maintain those that Renfield's referred to as revenants and what humankind refers to as vampires. The story places us in 1928, the height of the Jazz Age. Ramona is head of Renfield's Investigation and Enforcement Division, She's hunting on behalf of their client, the mayor of New York City, tracking down some out of control orphan vampires who have been making the native humans, who Renfield's referred to as paradoxons, disappear. Ramona landed noiselessly on the pavement from her eight story drop, a mere three feet behind the revelers. She adjusted her senses to their closeness and followed behind them in the shadows. She was close enough to hear the conversation as if she were one of their party, listening as the orphan guide goaded his followers on. Thousands of people walk the streets of New York daily, but only a very special few know of this place, he said. The group of young men and women tittered in excitement. Just around the block and down the stairs is the most provocative club in the city. I shouldn't have heard of it, he whispered. It's called Orpheus. Ramona's mouth fell open in shock and insult. Orpheus was the name of Renfield International's top rated club and speakeasy. Though certainly located in Manhattan, it was nowhere near the dingy location he had herded them to. It hurt her heart to think that these fraudsters had been invoking the name of Renfield to lure unsuspecting tourists and some foolhardy adventurous locals to their deaths. The Paradox and Authority would certainly have a field day with this, she thought angrily just giving them one more reason to impose restrictions on Renfield businesses in the city. With speed invisible to the paradox and eye, she rushed past the would-be clubbers, stopping between the stairwell and their guide. When they were able to perceive her suddenly standing at the top of the stairway, the group halted in surprise. Who the hell are you? The guide growled. I'm taken aback that you don't know, she replied, stalling. So you're her, he said with a dismissive grin. Well, this confrontation was to be expected sooner or later. Who is this? Members of his group began to demand angrily. She's not New York police. She's not even a man. Ramona flashed her badge. I represent a private security concern, Renfield International Investigations and Enforcement Division. As she spoke, a few of the revelers began stepping backward, inching out of the alleyway. These were apparently locals who understood the wide jurisdiction and power that Renfield's held in the city. Those who realized that death or injury at the hands of a Renfield, a Renfield officer would never be prosecuted or remedied. However, the others, the tourists, or otherwise uninformed, were unfazed and continued to gripe. The young man who was their leader and guide smirked, and the short span of time marking the duration of their confrontation 
his hands had already begun to show evidence of his orphan heritage. He was in the process of shifting. His previously manicured nails had sprouted sharp talons, then faster than his paradoxical followers could perceive, he grabbed the wrist of the young man nearest him and with exacting precision, sliced his palm open. The remainder of the group groaned and shrieked, watching in horror as blood poured from the gash onto the pavement. Then everyone's attention shifted when almost simultaneously, the door at the foot of the stairs crashed open. Ramona furrowed her brow. The little bastard had performed the equivalent of ringing a dinner bell, and it would be seconds before the orphans below scurried to the street level, anxious to gorge themselves on the buffet that the young monster had delivered to their doorstep. He had been very clever in taking the opportunity to catch her in the path between the ravenous predators and their unwitting prey. She glared at the grinning guide. This man, this man-child, could not have been more than 16, maybe 17 years of age, when he was taken, trapped in a near timeless post pubescent beauty. She felt a flurry of emotions, shock, sadness, anger. The revenant that was his sire ordained, the negligent fool that did this to him, was most likely transfixed by his beauty as much as she was. Many revenant orphans shifted their features to appear more attractive, to lure their prey, but this was no shift, she could tell. She could only imagine that after it had its way, having had its way, after having deprived this young male of his essence, that the revenant couldn't bear to destroy him. Even as his vicious, sanguinating fleems slid into place and his eyes shone with that telltale glimmer of impending violence, he remained beautiful. Ramona shook her head and swiftly leveled her weapon. She sighed. The universe of the paradox is definitely going to be a less beautiful place without him. She discharged her projectile weapon and three rounds ripped through the guide, forming a straight line from his throat to his heart to his viscera. His eyes were round with shock as a pink gelatinous foam spewed from the entry and exit wounds, each teeming with tiny, desperately clawing creatures resembling some grotesque aberration of the Order of Odentia. The group he was leading didn't have to be told. They took off in the opposite direction, screaming as his entire body began to brew and bubble with the rat-like creatures clawing and tearing at each other, trying to escape the corpse that had spawned them. Even the two orphans he had embedded with the group pretending to be other partiers, fled the scene. However, the basement full of orphans who had been built out of their promised meal were in no mood for retreat. They pushed up the stairwell in a howling wave, tumbling upward into the alley. The guide's quickly decomposing, then evaporating body was less than an afterthought to them as they pushed past Ramona, straining to recover their fleeing meal. Dressed in the Renfield Red uniform, Eugene and his well-trained team of six officers had already arrived, blocking the path from the alley, effectively eliminating any route to their intended prey or escape. While the orphans were occupied with Eugene, Ramona blocked off the stairwell, which represented their only means of easy retreat. The orphans went on the attack, shifting in the same manner that their revenant progenitors did, flames dropping into place, hands becoming gnarled and nail beds sprouting ferocious talons, their faces contorted, into grotesque masks resembling the rats and other vermin they had been constrained to consume in order to survive. Ramona imagined that to paradoxins, they might have been fearsome to behold, but to a seasoned Renfield enforcement team, they were merely a rowdy inconvenience. No projectile weapons would be employed in the close-in fracas. The Renfield officers unsheathed their bladed weapons and readied themselves to do what it was that they were bred and paid handsomely to do. Thank you very much for this opportunity to, uh, to read this afternoon. This is the first book of Ramona. The second book of Ramona will be launching uh, in September and available for purchase um, October uh, of Halloween. Thank you so much, Anne and Terry, for bringing me to this wonderful Strong Women, Strange Worlds. Thank you so much, Penelope. That was amazing. And yeah, way to leave us hanging. <laughs> So I think people will be excited to uh, find out more and to look forward to your new release. That was a great scene. Our next reader is uh, Carrie Lynn Jones. Carrie grew up in a rural community on the east coast of South Florida 
and lives there still with her husband, daughter, and an ever-growing menagerie of helpful animals. I know a few thing or two about helpful animals myself. So, Carrie, over to you. Thank you, Elaine. Um, today I'll be reading from chapter three, A Bowl of Milk and Bread with Honey. After Lumina has already carried out her plan to steal the tribute left for the goblins and found unexpected help in doing so. The goblin turned toward, back towards Hoax, who shimmered and shifted in the moonlight. Where once a tousled mane pony had stood, now was a large raven, stretching and shaking his wings, settling his feathers in place. Crow leapt lightly to the puka's back, the long tails of his great black coat blending with the midnight colored plumage so perfectly that they almost seemed of a piece. He looked down at Lumina, and she thought that he might have smiled, though it was difficult to tell with a visage such as his. Do not worry overly much about your debt to the Goblin King, Crow said. He often has his mind turned to more pressing matters and mayhap he will never collect. I will see you at moonrise tomorrow. And with that, Hoax launched them into the sky. Lumina did not stay to watch in which direction they flew. Instead, she turned, walking back to where Ember was waiting for her in the circle of white stones. The wood she had left for him had long ago turned to ash, but that mattered not at all to a salamander if he wished to stay. Still, it was courteous to provide him with more, as a hostess would provide her guests with food and drink. So she added more wood to the circle, Ember taking care not to come too close as she did. Sweet one, he said, picking up a small twig and watching as it turned to ash in his fingers. I am sure you know your own business, but I would offer you some advice. Beware of goblin gifts. Much like fairy gifts, they rarely come free. Oh, I'm sure there will be a price, she said, tossing him a small twig, which he caught. It too quickly turned to ash, leaving behind a wonderful piney scent. Still, I worry less about the gifts I have yet to be given than the debts I have already gained. Had Lumina stayed to watch in which direction the raven and his passenger had flown, she might have seen them circle to land just above her on one of the lone pine sheltering branches. Slipping off of Hoax's back, the goblin squatted down on the branch next to where the puka had perched. Neither the distance nor the foliage were obstacles that could stop them from seeing where the fairy and salamander were dancing below. The two moved in perfect harmony around the circle of stones, the elemental within and the sprite without, flames flashing in the air between them as she tossed small offerings to the salamander. The wind carried the sweetly scented smoke up to the branch where he and the puka sat. Hoax leaned forward so that his eye was on level with the goblin squatting next to him. He cocked his head so that one eye looked down on the dancers below while the other looked on the face of his companion. Interesting sprite, commented the puka. Yes, his companion replied. And was the milk that her kitten lapped up so readily slated for the Goblin King's table? He asked, still eyeing his companion. It was. Ah, said the puka, turning his full attention back to the sprite below. That will bring trouble. I'm sure it will. It's been half a century since one of the fairy trespassed against us so blatantly. One wonders if it was softness or speculation that stayed your hand. The puka's comment was met only with silence. And apparently I will continue to wonder, he sighed. Still, she seemed quite anxious about the kitten. And then there's the elemental. Do you think he is here by his will or someone else's? Could she have bound him? Again, he was met with silence. The puka sighed and ruffled his feathers. They stayed and watched as the night grew older until the dance reached its natural end. The dancers stood facing each other. The sprite reached up and plucked a single hair from her head, a shimmering strand of midnight blue which she tossed to the salamander. He caught it, and for the briefest instant it lay in his palm. Then with a flash of emerald light it was gone. 
but in its place was left a scent, a lovely scent, like the air just before a summer storm, sharp and clean and filled with life. Ah, so that answers that question, said Hoax. Still, I doubted as much of a hardship being bound to her. What do you think, Crow? He asked, drawing out the name Lumina had given to the goblin next to him. Should I try it and see? What would a fairy maid do with one such as you? Why, every goblin knows that answer. She would do what all maids are wont to do, pluck out my eyes and break my heart in two. He finished with a flourish of wings and what might have been a grin on his raven's face. Thank you for listening to me. And if you have, I don't know, a liking for fairy tales and folklore and find tales about goblins and cursed kings and fairy queens, bargains made and promises kept, long held animosity and love yet to be found, then Sign up at the end of the event for the giveaway and tell me what you think about Lumina and the Goblin King. Thank you again for your time. Thanks, Carrie. That was really beautiful. You'll have to scroll back through and see the uh, the comments that people were making. They were so excited about your use of language and all those different layers of mythology that you were working in there. It was great. There's a lot, a lot of uh, folklore in it throughout. So. Super cool. Our fourth reader is Wendy Van Camp. Wendy Van Camp writes science fiction, Regency romance, and speculative poetry. She is a twice Elgin finalist for her book, The Planets, a spy coup poetry collection. Wendy's short stories and poems have appeared in magazines such as Quantum Visions, Far Horizons, Spy Coup Fest, and The Starlight Spy Coup Review. Over to you, Wendy. Uh, thank you, Elaine. Um, actually, it's pronounced sci-fi coup, but that's okay. It's uh, it's kind of a, a unique poetry form. <laughs> um, anyway, um, before I begin reading from The Planets, which is my um, sci-fi coup and astro poetry uh, collection, um, I wanted to explain a little bit about what sci-fi coup is. Uh, sci-fi coup is kind of a uh, an offshoot of traditional Japanese haiku in that it's usually three lines. We try to kind of sort of do five, seven, five syllables, but it's not required. And of course, the theme is science fiction. Um, I like to write about um, astronomy um, as well. So um, sometimes my um, haiku um, style poems are also just about um the planets and other um, scientific um, items. Um, but yeah, essentially what I write is called sci-fi coup. Anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. These are just excerpts from various um, chapters of the book. Um, I decided to write about the nine planets of the solar system and my book kind of takes you on a literary journey. And uh, the poems allude to many scientific and historical facts about the planets. Um, and if you get into the poems, it kind of guides you uh, into certain ideas about them. But anyway, let's get started. Uh, the first one is called Mercury. I circle the sun in spin orbit resonance, lonely messenger. The next one is called Venus Impact. Sulfuric air of Venus burns meteors of certain size. Small rocks need not apply. The next one is called Dysporia. Life springs from the earth. Humans are as seeds on the wind, colonizing worlds. Next one is called Oceanus. We call our home Earth, part of our short-sighted hubris on a world of water. Mars, this elderly world, lost global magnetic field, can't hold its breath. Canals, mistaken translation, Italian Canelli creates hope of Martian life. Jupiter's rings, one bright main ring 
the halo forms an inner torus on edge glimmers gossamer dust. Saturn's rings. Rings spin their own path within the giant disk, mind the Cassini gap. Saturn's attraction. Love is magnetism as sparks flash in my winds, metallic hydrogen dynamo. This one is about the moon of Titan. Your deep canyons hold rivers of hydrocarbons. Will we plant our flag? Next one is Enceladus geysers. Hot geysers take aim at Saturn's magnetosphere, mingle and merge. Next is Uranus breath. In monotonous teal, methane hides soul of giant, wild winds storm beneath. The next one is called deep blue world. Methane not the reason what secrets lie beneath of Neptune's royal blue. And the last of this set is planet Pluto. In the Coupier belt, dwarves mingle with comets. Size doesn't matter. And that's the last of this poem. And as I was reading, um, the group has graciously been putting up my um, illustrations. The first one is actually from the book. I did illustrations of all the planets in my poetry collection. And the others are just um, sci-fi coup that I've done down through the years that have been published in various magazines that I've illustrated with pen and ink. Um, I hope you enjoy them. Um, you can see all the illustrations on my blog, No Wasted Ink. And uh, of course, uh, in the book are uh, all my illustrations of the planets. Um, next, I'd like to read a short story um, because poetry is very, very short. So it, it uh, goes very quickly. Um, this story is called Day of the Ficus, which is kind of a riff on Day of the Triffids. Um, and I wrote it in a writing challenge years ago and has since gone on to be published in several magazines. Uh, currently, you can find it in my account on Medium at W. Van Camp. Um, if you like the story, you can check it out there later. But let's go ahead and get started with Day of the Ficus. Dr. Pearson, there's a message coming in. Damn it, who the hell is still up there, Buttons? I am MCC, your mechanical cultivation cyborg. I do not answer to Buttons. Where's the blasted microphone? Three feet to your left and on the table, Dr. Pearson. This is Dr. Mary Pearson of the EPA. I thought everyone evacuated. Who are you and why the hell are you still here? Officer Roy Hayes, I helped with the evac, but I got cut off by those things. Don't touch them. Repeat, do not touch the plants. I might not have much choice. They're moving closer. Where's your location, Hayes? Third floor near Forever 21. I'm trapped behind the display window with the mannequins. Stay put, we're going to get you out of there, out. Dr. Pearson, I must protest. Nothing seems to kill Ficus Calipes. How will we rescue Officer Hayes and save them all? There's one thing we haven't tried. I need your help buttons. I still can't see. Damn plant and its protective goop went right into my eyes. I should have sent your metal hide in there instead of going myself. I was not manufactured for that purpose, doctor. I am a cultivator, not a destroyer. It is against my programming. This is your lucky day, Buttons. Get your mechanical gears in motion and lead me to the sports authority. I need gear. I do not answer to Buttons. Get your metal butt moving. Third floor, doctor. We are on level flooring again. Ficus at three o'clock four feet away. Take that, you nasty plant. Doctor, you almost flamed me with the weed burner. Do be careful. Just lead me to Forever 21. Ficus at 8.30, five feet ahead. Gotcha. You there. I have a pistol. Stand down with the flamethrower. Officer Hayes, it is Mary Pearson. We've come to rescue you. You've got to be kidding me. Are you all right, officer? My leg got crushed. Can't walk. 
the city PD contacted me. They're going to blow up the mall. They don't think there's any other way to contain these mutant plants. What about us? If we can get to the roof, a helicopter will lift us out. Will that weed burner get us there? You bet your sweet behind it will. Buttons, you're going to carry Officer Hayes and be my guide. We're counting on you. I do not answer to Buttons. Just lift the man. Dr. Pearson, they are ascending Officer Hayes into the helicopter. You are next. We would have never gotten this far without you. I am too heavy for the helicopter, Dr. Pearson. I'm sorry if there was any other way. I am only a machine. You're an AI, you have sentience. The rope is around you, doctor. You must go before they blow up the mall. You're a hero, MCC. Call me Buttons. And that's the end of the story. Again, if you liked it, it is available on Medium along with uh, many other of my short stories and poetry and articles. Um, I am also going to participate in the giveaway here at the reading. And um, I'm going to be giving away a free copy of The Planets, um, an ebook copy. Um, just go ahead and sign up in the giveaway. And uh, you'll, I'll uh, ask you later what sort of copy you want. I'll give away either a PDF, a Mobi or uh, EPUB, your choice. And um, I hope you enjoyed the planets and I hope you've enjoyed the short story. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much, Wendy. Uh, people are having a lot of fun with that in the comments, especially, oh dear, the ficus um, and, and poor Buttons. Uh, I don't know if that was the very end of the story. Perhaps Buttons goes on to some fabulous resurrection. Uh, no, no, that's the end. That was it. That was all, poor Buttons. We can write fanfic in which Buttons lives again. But in the meantime, I need to bring you over to our final reader for the day, Tori Bovalino. Tori is originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and lives in London with her partner and their very loud cat. Tori loves ghost stories, chai, and dusty old libraries. Her debut novel, The Devil Makes Three, is forthcoming from Page Street in the US or Titan Books in the UK. Tori. Hello, thanks everybody for coming and thank you for having us. I've so enjoyed listening to all of the other readings. It's been like quite the interesting afternoon. Um, so I am the author of The Devil Makes Three, looks like this. Um, it's about two teenagers who discover a book in their high school library um, and accidentally release a devil when they read it out loud. So I'll be reading from actually chapter 10, which is a little bit far in, but right when they're discovering the book. Um, all right, so without further ado. What are you looking for? Tess asked. Do you know what a grimoire is? She did, and not because she had any personal interest in the occult. The rumors of ghosts in Jessup Library didn't exist just because the library was old and creepy at night. Jessup held a massive collection of occult manuscripts. Grimoires, satanic texts, Wiccan books, voodoo guides, all were accounted for. So Tess had seen more than her fair share of grimoires, magic books containing spells, charms, and instructions on how to summon demons and the like. In fact, it was a running joke for students to find the most graphic spells in the Jessup grimoires and attempt to perform them in their dorm rooms. If any of them worked, Tess was pretty sure she would have heard about it. I do, she said. I saw you requested quite a few already. Elliot nodded. Yes, but they're all too light for my project. Tess thought of commenting on this. After all, if spell books were too light for what he was trying to do, what the hell was he looking for? And also, why was she getting herself involved? If he burnt Jessup down, trying to do some ridiculous, impossible spell, and Tess had something to do with it, she was certainly going to be fired. But there was also a sort of odd, distant curiosity. She didn't believe in magic, not in the same way she believed in ghosts. Perhaps that was because she had never seen magic with her own eyes. At least for ghosts, she could claim the proof of the specters that floated from room to room in her family's farmhouse, cold spots that showed up without warning and vanished a few minutes later. Maybe magic was a bit like that. And maybe, Tess thought dangerously, she wanted to see what Elliot Birch was planning to do, if only to see him fail catastrophically. He ruffled through the pages on his desk, uncovering a slim notebook. Elliot flipped through the pages to a list of crossed-off titles, 
But no, when he passed it to her, she saw that a few were missing strike throughs. The Book of Shadows, Death Spells, Secrets of the Undying, the Glencoe Grimoire. Oh, I've definitely seen some of these before, Tess said, in the basement cage. That's what I suspected, Elliot said. So then come with me. She led the way through the lounge and the locked door to the stacks, past the dumbwaiter to the stairs, down to the basement floor. This floor was different from the rest of the stacks, colder, mustier, older too if the rumors she'd heard were true. Jessup was built on top of a university building that had been damaged in a bizarre fire. Casualties unknown. Half of the basement was set aside for the sprawling special collections cage and the shelves and boxes climbed the walls. She used a smaller key to unlock the cage and pulled open the creaky grated door to let them in. Elliot watched with silent fascination. What? She asked, feeling self-conscious under his gaze. There's just so much protection for these, he said, running a finger down the side of the cage. For books. Tess shrugged. They're dangerous, apparently, she said. Out of the corner of her eye, she barely saw Elliot grimace. He followed her inside. He'd brought the notebook with the titles on it, and they both set to looking for the Grim Wars. So what exactly is your project on? Tess asked. Elliot's smile thinned to a line, and the fact that she noted it made Tess register that she was spending more time examining his face than she was examining the shelves. As if he had come to the same conclusion, Elliot looked away quickly. I've always been fascinated by the occult, ghosts and witches and magic and all. He was leaving something out, she could tell, but just as she wasn't telling him her secrets, she didn't expect him to tell her his. To her surprise, he continued. This, he said, sweeping a hand toward the books, or maybe the entire library itself. It almost makes folk bearable. He wasn't even pretending to look for the books anymore, so Tess gave the charade up as well and leaned against the shelves with her arms crossed. And it wouldn't be otherwise? Of course not, Elliot said quickly, and that blush immediately crept up his neck to his ears and over his cheeks, as if she was supposed to understand what he was talking about. I'm sorry, it doesn't matter. To answer your question, he said, I'm doing my research on death and resurrection in magic. He caught her eye for a moment too long. What the hell, Tess thought, but she had the sense not to say it out loud. And then, am I about to be murdered by Elliot Birch? Well, Tess said, trying not to show her surprise. Elliot seemed like such a practical, unenchanted sort of person, not even close to the type of person who would be interested in something like raising the dead. She'd be less surprised if he said he was studying intergalactic squirrels or something of the like. That sounds like an interesting project. Elliot nodded, but he looked disappointed, like she hadn't said what he'd expected, or like she said exactly what he'd expected. And that was even worse. They lapsed into an awkward bit of silence, moving around, looking for the books. Tess could sense Elliot next to her, and she saw him as he reached deep into a shelf, rubbing back to see if he could find anything. Hey, what's... The sound of Elliot's voice was cut off by a bizarre jarring sound, like metal grating against metal or stone, or a mechanical bit that hadn't moved in decades. The sound grew louder, and Tess realized that there was movement too, A bottom section of the shelf between Elliot and her was moving, sinking into the ground and taking the books down with it. The shelf descended until it was flush against the ground, revealing a dark square in the wall. Silence pressed between Elliot and Tess. Tess looked over her shoulder, certain someone someone had heard the noise and would come running, certain that it was a prank. Finally, breathlessly, Elliot asked, was that supposed to happen? Tess looked between Elliot and the hole. Now that her eyes were adjusting to the darkness within, she could make out stone steps leading down further into the pits of the library. She had no idea what could be down there, and it wasn't like her orientation tour of the stacks had included a discussion of the secret creepy passageway. No, she said, certain that this was far, far outside of her job description. No, that was not supposed to happen. And that's it. Oh, and I'm also doing a giveaway too. (laughs) which I completely forgot to mention, of a copy of the book. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Tori. That was very intriguing. We're all like, oh, yes, go in the basement. No, don't go in the basement. (laughs) (laughs) Never go in the basement.
So I want to begin by thanking everybody for coming. Uh, thank you all definitely to our readers. I believe that most of our authors can stick around for a little while to answer some questions and to chat. So if you do have questions, you can put them over in the chat or in a minute we're going to invite you to uh, turn on your cameras and microphones again so that you can interact with each other and with the authors. Make sure that you grab that handout. Uh, there is a PDF that's been posted a couple of times in the chat so that you can keep track of all of these authors, uh, several of whom have upcoming releases. And our next event is going to be on September 16th at 5 p.m. That's Eastern Time. And I'm going to put the pre-registration link over there in the chat also so that you can sign up right now and make sure that you get all the information. So at this time, I'm going to invite everybody to uh, unmute themselves and turn on your cameras so you can mingle with the authors for a little while before we have to get back to our regular days. Thank you all so much for coming. If you do have any trouble turning on your camera or mic, or if you get a message that says you need the host's permission, then please reach out to one of us in the chat and we can take care of that for you. 